on the microphone. Yeah. Right? yeah. All right. Oh, well, you know how uh, mics work, so we'll be good. Um, yeah, so we're going to kick it off. And then at the end, it's sort of, it's a little bit abrupt. We go, thank you so much. And then we talk about you. Wendy always does that. I'm always like, let Wendy do, like, okay, we're done now. Goodbye. <laughs> and then we'll talk a little bit more about you. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for doing this. So we'll, um, we're going to get going and uh, yeah. And it's short. It's only like 35, 40 minutes. It'll feel short. Some, some don't, um, some feel quite long, but I'm sure that won't be the case. All right. We are recording. So uh, the Inventionables, and this is with Josie Dye and Cynthia Loist. All right. Can I, can I just change one thing? What's yeah. that? Here yeah. we go. It, it's Cynthia and Josie's Unmentionables. Okay. Only because if you Google Unmentionables, other it, something I know I've done that. Something else comes up. Yeah. What does my my son say? Don't when you get Google Gary Oldman. Don't forget the R. Think, Think Gary? about it. That you get gay old man. <laughs> Right. Wendy. Yeah. You you have come a long way from your CBC days. Oh yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I I'm not yes, sure. You what have. You it, but yes, it's a uh, well, it's been a big change. Yes, but I'm thinking, you know, well, in all sorts of ways, but basically, uh, as a presumably impartial journalist on the state broadcaster, you couldn't say poop if you had a mouthful of it. Uh, poop yeah now i can say poop well there there's an image actually. there's an image <laughs> and now we talk or you talk but we talk about all sorts of things with all sorts of people we talk about uh we talk about mental health sex and sexuality terrible things that we've done terrible things that have been done to us pretty much anything yeah it's kind of neat actually the uh, realizing that every well i realized this even before the podcast but it's really driven at home that everybody's weird so we've just talked about everything we put everything out there whether it's failure or joy or something in between we talk about everything it's great we do the question is what won't we talk about uh well we don't talk about the actual sex act very much <laughs> <laughs> we don't like unless it's hilarious anything is anything is good if it's hilarious and we don't talk a lot about porn so maybe no those they're those are two they're, they're, that's sort of a venn diagram but uh the, personally i will talk about anything on this podcast that i will talk about with my friends but as i started to think about this i realized there are things i won't talk about with my friends like like what i thought i knew yeah, everything. You, you are my friend but i'm not great with bodily functions if they're my own um, hmm. and yeah, the, you know, that, that kind of thing. I, I have a friend, well, she's an ex friend, but she would always talk also about her sex life with her husband. And I found that really, you know, she'd be like, Oh, Paul and I, not his real name where, you know, I was giving him a blow job and I'm like, Oh, I don't want to know. I don't want, so I'm not good that way. Well, we have to go back to human bodily functions because that was something you know, like TV is supposed to be really glamorous, right? So there was never any pooping, God forbid, or farting or sneezing or snore. There was never anything like that because we, it was like it was glamorous and it was news. And so but then we would go to tape and we would say, and now Anna Maria Tremonti from wherever. And then we'd vomit. So thank you well, not, <laughs> not at Anna Maria, but just, you know, for sure. Well, I, yeah. I understand that. I, okay, so sex and money. Money is another weird one, um, especially my own. Um, sex, sex and money. And money. There isn't enough of either. That's basically all I want to tell you. That's... And I worry. I worry if I talk about other people, like my family, and uh, and stuff that they've been up to, that they will they will get mad at me. And I think that's uh, a problem that a lot of broad and podcasters have. Yeah, I was really careful. Partly be it was a CBC thing, but also because. Uh, my mom was still alive. My mom raised me. So, and then she died. And then I was free to talk about my mom and my dad, who was gay, a big secret, but whatever. I wasn't comfortable to talk about that uh, while she was alive, but now she's dead. So I like to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Everything. It's different. You talk a lot about your husband and your kids and I'm, I don't know. I'm a little squeamish. I'm much more I, You have to tell Kate and Liam that the only reason why you married him and had her was so you'd have material for your career. And once you've got that clear, then you're free to do whatever you want. Uh, we don't have to talk about all these unmentionable things because 
Well, yeah, because you may have seen in the bottom screen, uh, we have two people who do talk about these unmentionable topics. That's actually the name of their podcast. Uh, they go there. They talk about hemorrhoids, cheating, and broken penises. I haven't heard that word yet. This, it's not Aaron Davis and Lisa Brandt, is it? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I'm just kidding. Ladies, if you're listening, no, no. This is uh, this is uh, Cynthia Lois and Josie Dye, or Josie Dye and Cynthia Lois on menstruals, and uh, that's what it is. Yeah, so they call it the podcast where you're too that you're too shy to ask for, uh, and they they're our guests this week. Look at them. We promised you fearless and funny. Hello, women. Hello, hello, Josie. Hi, Cynthia. Hello. Welcome. Hi. Thank you for Was having that a us. Is penis or are you sharing a microphone? What, what we you share know? things that look like this often. <laughs> we're not that. We're not that. We're not there. We're not there yet. Well, let me ask you something. I've known Josie since she was a teenager. Like I've I've known Josie since you were a kid, and I've watched Cynthia. I I just found out that you actually have not known each other all that long, have you? Yeah, we we kind of met. We'd met through the industry. Obviously, she'd been on the social a few times, um, and I don't know. We had kind of mutual friends, but it wasn't until the pandemic that we actually became close because I was looking for a place to send my son to school because I didn't feel comfortable with him doing virtual, and so I was looking for some families to get together and you know maybe have a little pod started. And then through the grapevine, I heard that Josie was already on it and doing it, and they needed one slot left. Mm -hmm. And they really wanted someone who had a son. And so I was like, pick me. Right. Yeah. And this, I, I don't know if you can see, I can actually, you probably don't want to see past this square because it looks good in this square. But if I just move a little bit, there's little desks. Oh, square. So you oh. can kind of see, I shouldn't really move that. No, um, but that's, that's great. That, that was your school. This is the school in the basement and the five kids, they were down here with a teacher that we hired. And uh, yeah, every day we had a school in the basement, which was amazing. And I mean, I think that's where this whole idea was born because basically we, for almost a year and a half, maybe two years, didn't see anybody else. It was just us, our husbands and partners and our kids. We kind of really got into, bubbled. yeah, we bubbled. Yeah. We bubbled together for that entire time. And so during that time, Josie and I, we found ourselves like over a glass of wine, just starting to talk about ridiculous things. And we thought maybe there's something to this. So we started building it from there. Wow. So Cynthia, you're the only one who didn't, uh, among the four of us, who didn't work at CKFM. I worked there. Maureen obviously stayed there for a while. I was only there for a brief period, but it's kind of weird. And and in those days, we would talk about things with our girlfriends, but we would never, never talk about Oh, God, no. Here. So it's, uh, yeah, a lot of things have changed. I, I had a flashback to CKFM. It, it was all, except for Betty Kennedy, who was like the queen, and she was like a thousand years old, which was probably not that old, but it seemed like a thousand to me at the time. Totally our age. <laughs> yeah, um, but it was all it was all men. And so women, I don't know, we, we talked about stuff secretly, but we never talked openly. So you guys are, yeah, you guys are. So that would be the 99.9 now that Cynthia has been on a million times because Belle obviously owns 99.9. So she kind of, you're like a it's part of the right family. Yeah. I yeah, talked about sex the... on that in the morning sometimes. Yeah. I think I, I think I bothered them because instead of using uh, the words like hoo-ha and, and yeah. the JJ, they, I wanted to use actual proper names yeah. and yeah. they didn't like that so much. No, <laughs> no. It makes men very uncomfortable. The word vagina makes men very uncomfortable. It actually makes a lot of women uncomfortable too, particularly of a certain generation. But I hear you. I, after CKFM, I spent 15 years at Q107, which was a complete boys fast which Josie's totally familiar with because she was down the hall at the edge at the time and yeah I was I was the woman and if I mentioned womanly things and did it in a womanly way meaning using the correct words you could see the men's faces would be like uh, don't hurt me with your words and you know you don't so call it a penis funny. you call it a dick like yeah. you know th that's yeah. it's so delineated well, it's like comedians who do like they, they screw each other up the behind or they do proctology jokes. But if a woman makes a joke about something, it's not funny. So it's like a lot of things have changed, but a lot of things haven't changed. So a lot of things yeah. haven't changed. Yes. So tell us about some of the things that you've talked about. I've heard a couple of your episodes, but just for those that haven't, where where do you go? 
Well, we started with hemorrhoids. <laughs> <laughs> Where okay. do you go from there? Yeah, um, really. <laughs> yeah. So we started with hemorrhoids and that was honestly how we met. Uh, we tell the story in, in the podcast. It's like, we'd already started this pod, but really we bonded over hemorrhoids. Oh. Um, yeah. I don't know if you want me to go tell you about that or not. Or well, you going. can. Oh, it's Root totally. That part. Yeah. But... So uh, Cynthia was, it's a very open person. And as we were talking, she was telling me that she was having problems with hemorrhoids and I was going through surgery for hemorrhoids. And I honestly thought she must know some, like my husband has told her this because why would she be sharing this really personal you know, secret with me. So oh, I stopped and I was like, you know, you know, don't you, you know. And I had been lying about this medical problem that I had been having for about a month. I said to everybody that my thyroid needed to come out. Yeah. Yeah. That's always, you always blame the thyroid. It was this mysterious medical problem that she had and, and it was hard to pin down. And anyway, I just was like on the phone with her and I said like, yeah, I'm in a terrible mood because I've got hemorrhoids. And I, and there was a pause in the phone on the phone and I, and I thought, oh, I've gone too far with our friendship. I've I've opened up a door that I can't close. But it turns out that that's what she had. And so we we laughed. We mm -hmm. we because it and it was one of those things where when, when it came time to do the podcast, I was like, we have to start with that. And you were I like, did not want to. I did not want to. I was like, because also I had lied to my work forever. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> I had lied to them and told them oh, I had my thyroid out. Wow. So how does that okay. podcast come out? And then like my bosses and the owner of the company, they realized they gave me all this time off work for hemorrhoid surgery. How do you explain, it's like, I know when you have your thyroid, you have, it, they take it out of your neck. And when you have hemorrhoid surgery, you have to sit on a donut. So I'm not really sure how you, <laughs> yeah, there's no sense to be made Maureen no. of this done. <laughs> Well, there is a little bit because there is a little bit because when I did have my son, my thyroid was messed up. So I kind of knew a little bit about that. And that's why I was like, it's not really a big deal if your thyroid's messed up. Like it, I, I knew I could go down that path. And um, I talk pretty openly in the podcast about how someone asks to see my scar <laughs> and oh, my co-host. Oh. And I ran to the bathroom and I got eyeliner and I started putting it on my neck. And I was like, wow. Hey. And he was like, oh, cool. Wow. <laughs> So did you draw like these stitch marks and everything or? I drew like a little, and I, I, I actually said they didn't go right in. Like I was, you know, I was Googling, I was looking at all the information. Ugh. She drew a little black line right there and that was it. She was deep in this line. I, to me, this was an illumination about like just how much shame and mm, yeah. embarrassment uh, that women have to go through. Like 50% of the population experiences hemorrhoids. And I think more than, I think more than that, probably they just don't admit it. They don't, they don't say. Yeah. 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 No one talks about it. So I think that, that this was one of those perfect ones. And literally right after we, we released the first one, I don't even think we'd gone public. I don't think we publicly announced we were going for a walk down in the beaches and this woman, and I, she was very styly yeah, and she was, how, she got kind of, every time Cynthia tells the story, she's like, she was very styly. I don't know why that's an important <laughs> detail. She looked stylish and she was with her baby so cool. and her uh, husband and she stopped us and she goes, I just listened to your podcast about hemorrhoids and, or no, she didn't say hemorrhoids. No. She said, I just listened to your podcast and I loved it. And let me just say, going through it now. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, that yeah. you're, if you, you're probably going to get a lot more of that as you open up this Pandora's box. And well, you'll yeah, you people... what are you getting? Oh, sorry, say that again. What kind of reaction are you getting? Oh, we're getting great reaction. We are every day we text each other or call each other. And we're like, did you just see that email? Did you just see that message? Um, people are, people have responded really well to this. I, I mean, it, it's, Something that has been quite emotional because we, we launched it not knowing, you never know what's going to happen or how it's going to be received. And so to hear people saying that they're laughing, that they feel seen, that they feel like relatable, that they're sitting in with their closest girlfriends or even the girlfriends that they never thought they could talk to about this stuff. And it's funny, the ones that resonate with people, like some people um, we, we talked about, and it was a more serious one about a weight loss journey that we went on um, that kind of made us really obsessive and over-controlled and it was really problematic. That one has resonated with people. You yeah. said someone at your work was crying about it. So we're doing a range of topics because as you, Maureen, started off the top, like unmentionables is a broad topic. 
And so mm-hmm. while sex and bodily functions is a huge part of that, there is also, I like I envision us talking about everything from death to identity to, you know, money, like all those things I think have a place in, in, in our sort of secretive shame filled world that we're hoping to get people to open up more about misogyny. Yeah. There's a whole bunch. Ooh, oh yeah. Gosh. Oh yeah. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Sorry. Joel's broken uh, penis. <laughs> 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 that that the, Joel's Josie's husband, long suffering, I might say, uh, but in my family. Yeah. <laughs> so so obviously not a problem because as Wendy and I were saying off the top, we've our families are like, well, what? Just don't. I don't want any of my shit out there. So this is kind of a surprise. Well, Joel was first to document this on his Instagram. So oh, when so he'd it already happens... he'd already gone out. Okay. When it happened, he knew, like your families probably know, that I have a microphone every single morning and that I tell personal stories on air. And I think he wanted to get ahead of it. He (laughs) was like, I'm going to have the narrative. I am going to be in charge of my own story this time instead of me going, Joel, so what part can I say? Can I say this part? Or, you know, you just never know. It's like broken telephone, how things translate on air. So he started it. He came out uh, the second day, like the day after this happened, he broke his penis. He told everybody. And like us, he had men all over the world because my husband travels. He's a a music, um, he's a manager. He manages some big bands in Canada, travels all over the world. And he had men everywhere in Australia, at the Grammys, everywhere, come up to him and say, (laughs) tell me about your penis. (laughs) <laughs> like they all wanted to know about his penis. And so he's been educating men across the world. And we thought we would tell the story as well. And it was a nice way for us also. We've had a lot of females, you know, listening to this podcast. But I think just this week, there's been a lot of males that have jumped on board, which is fun. Hmm. So is there stuff that you won't talk about? I mean, obviously, if you're not going to talk about it, you're not going to tell us. But is there any limit? Like, is there like we I guess in our in our lead up, Maureen and I talked about how there's certain limits. Like, I don't want to talk about porn. Is is there anything that you don't we should we should just uh, when I'm just going to say we've had, you know, because we're called women of ill repute. We've had porn workers or sex workers, which is probably the who who've asked us if we wanted to talk to them. It's not that we don't, we might down the line, but that's sort of like, we we're not there yet. Um, I just, I just don't want Wendy. I don't want them to think that, you know, porn comes up all the time and we're like, absolutely not. But <laughs> no, no, I, I'm very pro porn. I, it's just, it's <laughs> top secret. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. I, I like when it, I obviously my background, I started out as a producer for uh, sex TV and uh, you know, I've been a sex educator for a long time. I got a sex education certificate from the university of Michigan. So it's my beat. So I feel very comfortable in that space. Having said that, I also am with um, a partner who is a cinematographer and he's a complete introvert. He is not on my Instagram. He's shy. So I have to navigate carefully where I, you know, where I step, because I, like you were saying off the top, it's one thing when it's your story, it's another thing when it involves your other family members. And so I guess there's, there's a space there. Although having said that, accompanying this podcast, we have a video series, a YouTube series, and Jason, my partner shot Shot them. So we were sitting there talking about like, really odd sexual experiences and he was behind the camera so we're still together so yeah. but i think yeah. my biggest my biggest line right now probably is around him and our personal experiences and then my family because uh, you know i would never or anybody else in my life's story if it implicates them i'd have to clear it with them first Absolutely. do you have a line yeah it's the same thing i mean even though joel is pretty open about you know, his penis breaking, there are certain <laughs> things that he didn't feel comfortable with us talking about and he's already flagged them. Yep. So we'd had to t- take a couple of things down already. Um, and yeah, I have to be mindful of my kids, obviously. But we've yeah. talked a lot about this. Ki- and you have a really um, great philosophy about Jaya, Jaya's Cynthia's son. Yeah, because I did have that worry when we first launched this. I thought to myself, there's always that fear that, you know, your kid is going to, you know, see something and, and think of you differently. And I, I was saying this to a friend of mine. And she said, you know what? Your kids, when they hit teenagerhood, teen- chances are they're going to be embarrassed of you anyway. No matter what. Right? Mm-hmm. And the thing is, that this is part of who I am. Like, I, I, And I do really fundamentally believe that shame and secrecy is what 
breeds the worst parts of humanity. It makes people angry. It makes people fearful. It makes judgmental. people judgmental of other people. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the fact is that all the stuff that we're talking about are very human and are very relatable. And so I think that hopefully my friends thought this, she's like, you're going to raise a son who sees you and knows that you believe had a belief system and he's going to respect you for that. So I'm holding just fine line though. Right. You know, like it's uh, my daughter. I don't want to say her last name, which is my husband's last name. It's not that hard to figure out, but, but I was very deliberate to not give her my name because I thought it was really important that she get to establish. And, and she's been quite grateful for, for that, that she gets to say, I am my own person. I do my own thing. But now I'm of an age where like Maureen and I talk about all kinds of things and we want to get other people to talk about about things. And so th there's a little bit of of hypocrisy there. But then I don't know, kids, kids and husbands are complicated because they want they want to be honored. They want to be part of your life, but they also want to be in control. And and uh, yeah, I remember the first time walking down the street when uh, our daughter was like five and she rolled her eyes because we said something embarrassing. So yeah, she she's still rolling her eyes and we're, we're still embarrassing. But uh, but but yeah, it, it is a, it is a fine line between sort of addressing shame and protecting people that you love. The word shame has come up uh, a few times and Cynthia, you've used it too. And it's amazing how women in particular, all of us, but women in particular are raised to be, oh, that's, that's a shame. That's, that's, you should be ashamed of yourself. And what a waste of an emotion that is, unless you actually have done something shameful. Well, I was raised Catholic. So embedded in your entire experience as a girl, yeah. you had the same, like, it's just, it's part and parcel of the way that you're, you're taught to be female. And I think, you know, not to negate the experiences of men in that religion as well, but there was a through line with all the women in my life um, that you were supposed to not trust your body. You were not supposed to indulge in your desires. Everything was a slippery slope to ruin. Um, and it really messed up the people closest to me. There was all kinds of teenage pregnancies surrounding me. Like I saw the, the very real impact of what happens when you don't empower and inform girls to know their bodies, to have a voice, to say what they want. And so this has been like a, like a, like a battle cry for me for a long, long time. And so to me, there's an, I feel I feel zero shame about it. And I will, like, I don't have any, um, I don't have any wavering around that. Also, we do a, a really good episode about cheating, which is a, an incredibly taboo subject, right? And if you think about it, and we talk about our own experiences with infidelity, and you think about it, you know, men, it's more acceptable when a man cheats versus when a woman cheats. And women are slut shamed. And, you know, going back to the age of time, they had a, a scarlet letter A on them, or, you know, they were stoned. And men, it's like, Oh, we can we can understand it. We understand how and why. So I think this is really great for us to openly discuss some of these issues and do it in, in our way too. So I don't feel so ashamed about some of the stories because we're talking about them and we're um yeah we're talking openly about them. Yeah, yeah I said the the menopause word to a, a male friend um, and he was like. <laughs> don't issue that word like that's disgusting and i was like yeah that it can periods be. periods I mean, are uh on about it yeah it's yeah. but why should it be banned like we talk about all these crazy things that that have happened to men and it actually does yeah i always thought it wouldn't happen to me it just happened to crazy old ladies but but then you <laughs> you turn 50 and you know stuff or you have cancer and things happen earlier um and it happens to everybody so why can't we talk about it because we can't we still can't I mean, we can say vagina instead of the JJ, maybe. And that to me even bothers me. Like I've gone on a rant on the social recently about the fact that like, we shouldn't be saying vagina because the vagina is the birthing canal. And that's yeah. what it is. The equivalent of, of penis is the clitoris, right? And we don't say that ever because that's a useless very useful, but in, in, in a patriarchal society, the clitoris only serves pleasure. So we, we erase it when we talk about the vagina and the penis being similar to one another. It should be the vulva is actually the word that we should be using because oh, yeah. that includes yeah. the clitoris. This, this, no this. one uses the word vulva. No one. I know. It is this an is unused my, word. This is a hill I will die on. My son <laughs> will use the word vulva and he will be made fun of. And I will tell him this is what most people say vagina, but vulva is actually the proper word. Because if we want men also to grow up to, who are heterosexual to understand the female anatomy, to be better lovers, to be more understanding of consent. It starts there. So yeah, that's my rant. <laughs> it's a good rant. <laughs>
she she doesn't need us to plug her, but have you guys watched Cara Delevingne's uh, Planet Sex? Yep. It's it's quite yeah. yeah, she she goes there, she goes there. You yeah. know, she had she made a plaster mold of her vulva, but she wouldn't show it on camera. <laughs> Well, she's also part and parcel. She makes a, like, she's partnered with um, a woman who is the front of a sex toy company, a very high tech sex toy company. And she's used her name um, for that. So yeah, I mean, there are things, there are people who are taking control. Pleasure is a big, important subject that none of us learned about in sex ed. It was all about sex for procreation. And if we start to re- add that into I think women's lives, the idea of seeking out pleasure, not just in the bedroom, but in the boardroom and in, you know, all spaces, I think there's like a revolution to be had there as well. And women need to start judging other women also for seeking out those things. Well, you guys are, I don't know, you're probably 20 years younger than me. And I'd like to think that everything had has changed. But uh, the other day I was in a flea market and there was some lady who said, yeah, I was, I remember you, I was a flight attendant and, and we got pregnant or somebody got pregnant and they had to leave. And I thought, you know, this woman is still alive. I knew that happened in my grandmother's time that she had to stop mm-hmm. being a teacher when she got pregnant. But I remember, and, and I'm not like, I'm not, I'm not a young person anymore, but I'm still alive. And I remember, I'm sure you do too, Maureen, that when we had cancer, you weren't supposed to talk about it. It was like oh, revolution. Yeah, cancer. yeah you weren't supposed to cancer, let alone appear on the air with a big belly. I like that's only 15 years ago. It's not yeah. things are still things are still changing. Uh-huh. And I would actually add to that. I find, you know, like our kids, they're so you're the generation after us and our kids are the generation up to that because our kids are in their twenties. Found them and I have boys and Wendy has has a daughter. I find them very prudish. I find like they don't shower together um, anymore. The very like my son played hockey, and but they never showered. Which can you just imagine? Uh, communally, and there's and then I've I've heard that this young generation is having less sex than previous generations, and, I've and read that. yeah, I find it kind of astonishing that we seem to be, despite or maybe because of social media, that we're heading I... in that back in that direction. I think that stat around uh, the kids of this generation having less sex is an interesting one. And I think it needs to be teased out. I think some of the reason why may be because they're prudish. I, I, I suspect that that's not the entire story. It might be that they're more on their devices and they're connecting less in person. They're more intimidated. I think it's also that they're getting confused messaging about who is initiating, what that means, consent is complicated. But I think one of the biggest reasons might be that, and I hope this is true, the young women are having less or refusing to have sex that they don't want to have. Oh. Um, oh. And I think that's because I, like, I think that there was a lot of sex in many generations yeah. in the past that happened just because it was like, I guess I got to put out if I want to keep this guy. And I hope, and I may be wrong that more and more women feel empowered to say like, yeah, I'm not, you're not doing it for me at this level. So you're not going to go any further. Are we know. talking about sex? Like, cause I, I'm going to have to like click off cause this is just going <laughs> to <laughs> I would add to that, you, Cynthia, as the mother of, of boys, nice, nice man, nice young men with lovely girlfriends, that they are also very aware mm-hmm. of not yes. ever, you know, like the permission thing that goes way beyond that. It's like you don't ever, they no longer see themselves as people that have to get sex yep. to achieve it. Yep. Um, so I guess in that sense, it's a step in the right direction. Absolutely. You think about all of the sex that you had in high school that you didn't want to Right? Honestly? Exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All the sex I didn't want. All the sex I didn't want to have. <laughs> or at least that wasn't pleasurable, right? Yeah. Or that, yeah, right? you just felt that that's what the cool kids were doing. So, the and cool didn't know how to tell anybody. I don't really like that. <laughs> but that's still happening. I mean, I'm now that I'm sort of quasi retired, uh, Maureen and I do this podcast, but I have a lot more time off than when I was a, a news person. And I, so I'm skiing and I'm going up the hill and there's all of these bras from young women are like, oh, I've had, it's supposed to be in the, oh, in the trees, in the trees. trees. Yeah. yeah. Where is this place? No, it's, it's, it happens everywhere. (laughs) All ski hills you will find. Is this what happens at ski hills? Yeah. (laughs) Well, I think think it's girls, I think it's girls weekends and they're just, they, uh, y'all bring. Yeah, because I go skiing every Sunday, and I'm going to start looking in the trees. I don't see any bras. <laughs> but this is called Lake Ridge, Ontario, so maybe it's a little like not as cool as where you're going. 
could be. Yeah. Could be. How do you find, so Josie, you work with boys and they live with boys and, yes. and Cynthia, you work with women. Um, do you ever talk about you, your, your, your shared experiences and your very different experiences? We often do <laughs> a lot. Yes. Our very different experiences. Um, do you want to go ahead? Well, I mean, they each come with their own. There's no perfect team dynamics. Right. And I think I've had the great benefit of having a lot of great female leaders and great female teams. Um, and, you know, I came up in an era where I think there were so few spots, seats at the table for women. Um, it, like I started as a producer, right? So I didn't have to deal with it. It was just a very interesting, eclectic group of men and women, um, you know, trans. Like it was a whole, sex TV was very eclectic. When I moved into the on-air space, I could feel a shift because I believe that the generation just above me found that the, there was a bit more of a threat is what it felt like. I remember meeting with somebody who I'm very much admired in the industry and asking for some sort of tips. And it was a very frosty exchange. And I, hmm. I, I, I don't judge that. I, I, I know the way in which women were treated in this industry for so many years, particularly on air, and the way in which men also manipulated them to be threatened by other women. So so one of the things that happened early on with when I, when I got to the social was that we, we made a patch with each other that we were like, we have each other's backs. We have to, we have to align with each other. Even if we we're not going to always like each other and we do fight like sisters sometimes, but we have to have each other's back. And since then there's been a lot more growth there's been a lot more females in, in front of the camera. And I know that when people have come to me to be mentored, I, I remember one time I had checked myself because I was a little bit like, I don't know, but this girl's a bit of a hustler. And then I was like, stop it. Mm -hmm. This is wonderful. I will mentor her. Sh like, shut that voice down. I'm not continuing that on. Sorry, you were going to say something. No, about that. I mean, I want to talk about the, the how many women are at the seat at the table because it's often like you're playing musical chairs and you're trying to get that seat, right? So um, there's a lot of competitiveness with women in our industry. And it's because there are only so many seats like at the table. I feel now more seats. More seats, but in rock radio, definitely less. And that's kind of how I grew up. And I, I still, I'm still trying to deal with me as a female in this industry. And I think like there, there's a moment where there's times where I think, I don't think I was a great female, female, and it's nothing to do with the way I treated other women. But I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that I was the boy's girl. I was the girl that got along with the boys. I was the girl that when they were laughing sometimes at other women, I would be there and not say anything in hopes that I wouldn't be the target. And by being that person, it's almost like I let misogyny just take over. Instead mm -hmm. of, and, and then one day, eventually I grew up, because I started in radio young, like I was you know 17 in radio. And one day I stood up and I realized by me being silent and being the only girl that hasn't been fired at the edge after 12 other women have been, I'm not being like the cool chick. I'm being the girl that helps breed this misogyny that, you know, continues to this day. So I think that to me was like, I'm just starting to figure that out now. And it's taken a long time because I work with all men all the time. I still can't believe, again, in radio, looking in, like, I remember saying to you one day, like, why, why, we were talking about morning shows, and I was like, why couldn't, you know, there be two, just three females or two females? And she's like, that's never been done. It doesn't happen. Like, how is it? I feel like I see all kinds of sports radio shows with three guys, often three white guys. Or, or radio shows in general with all men, not even sports. I'm talking rock, pop, all guys. But you put two females together, and oh, my God, those voices with each other how do you tell each other apart how do you figure that out oh i can't hear two females on the air like this is mind-boggling fucked up it's actually crazy so we have a long way to go yeah yeah there are there are a couple of shows that are hosted by two women but they're not they're they're you know mar i shouldn't say marginal but they're not the big stations they of course. they do do yes. that uh, Josie, everything that you say you know i was feeling the same thing down the hall right mm -hmm. it was the same same deal so it's I just get these washes of not shame. But, There's that word again, but that, but you see, know, this, that's. And this is a thing I have to realize too. It's not my job to stop massage. Like this is not my job. In fact, it should be men that are taking on this issue that are tackling this issue and the good men, 
Like the the men, and of course, every man is going to be a little biased because they're male, but um, there are incredible men that work in radio. There are so many of them, and they should be standing up for the women in radio. They I should be having I'm, a voice. Don't you think that's changing? Like, I, I find that. Like, I, I remember when I was on the Hill and there weren't very many women a thousand years ago, and Anita Hill was... Uh, she was speaking out against the appointment of the nomination of a Supreme Court justice. And everyone was like, Oh, she's just a slut. And she probably slept her way to the top. And she's saying that he shouldn't be there because he's a pervert and, and nobody believed her. And, and all the men in the office were, Oh, she's just a slut. And ha 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 ha. But I don't think that would happen today. I like maybe with the, <laughs> Oh dear. Back to your, your podcast. <laughs> so tell me what, to, what, what else is coming up? What, what have you got? And, Sometimes you have experts on, but sometimes it's just the two of you. Um, will you will you take questions from the audience or people who want to relate their weird experiences? Tell us what we can. What else is coming down the pike? Yeah, I mean, we do have a woman who she's a real estate agent by day, and but in the rest of her life, she has cats and two husbands. So we talked to her about how she navigates that life and how she clearly they know husband. about each other. They do. They all live together. They have separate bedrooms. It's a complicated yeah. story that we got exhausted listening to. You know, and they actually don't have a lot of sex. Like they don't, which was mind boggling too. Sex isn't like the whole thing. And I think it's exhausting. Can you imagine having two husbands? Exactly. It's exhausting. Exhausting. Um, but yeah, we also uh, tackle some rumors about us. So there have been rumors in the industry, um, whether it's we slept our way to the top or it's that Cynthia over here is sleeping with a Canadian celebrity. We, uh, we, yeah, we go there. The bottom of yeah. it. Uh, we're also talking about hockey gate, which was a big deal. Um, uh, like basically on the social, there was a, a comment made by one of my co-hosts and it sent a firestorm, um, for, for a long time that was very traumatic for all people involved. So we've got her on talking about speaking out using her voice. Um, yeah, those are just a fa sexual fantasy. We interview a Dutch researcher who is so charming and his whole thing is he actually brings people on stage to share from people from all ages and all cultural backgrounds to talk about their sexual fantasies and he was just so delightful and sort of joyful and curious like a you know a journalist but he's managed to find this little weird sweet spot and written a book about it he and another woman do this so we interviewed him about about what sort of sexual fantasies also say about the culture that we are from about what we kind of repress and what it means about us, when we should introduce it in a new partnership. Those are just some of the things yeah. that are coming out. Oh, have you interviewed Maureen about that one? No. no. About what? <laughs> about sexual fantasies? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Listen, I'll watch, but no, I, I, I can't. I'm, con I'm, con I'm content bred too, like Cynthia. And I, you know, it's still... <laughs> It's still in there. So, uh, but it's a uh, good luck, you guys. This is wonderful. I think you're absolutely the right people to be doing this. It's nice that you enjoy each other for whatever that means. We'll put that rumor <laughs> out there. Um, and hope you're having, uh, having fun. Wendy and I are, and this is a wonderful, wonderful way to, to, um, it's great to work this way, isn't it? Yeah. And we're just looking forward to be, to develop this community as I'm sure like you, reach out to women who listen to your stories and connect with you and talk to you. And we're just trying to encourage our listeners to start sharing their stories too. There's something very cathartic, I think about it. We really wish you both all the best. And it's uh, I wish that you would say that everything's fixed and everything's different and it's not, but things are, they're, they're better. And, and you're part of making things better, better. So, uh, so it's great. Right back Thank at you, you guys. Thank yeah, you so much guys. for including us. It was absolutely our pleasure. Bye. <laughs> And now we let you go. Um, quick question. I'm just going to stop recording. They were lovely. Lovely. Yes. Lovely. Yeah. I did not know that. I, I think I knew, but Cynthia has the, 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 um, uh, I mean, she's, she, she is a major in gender studies and she's, you know, worked. So she has, I mean, you were saying off, off air, anybody can be an expert if they just say they are, but uh, I think she's Well, that's definitely... the way it seems today, but she actually has a few degrees and she feels very strongly about, um, I, I, I'm still not sure I can say the C word, which is, starts with C-L-I-T. <laughs> <laughs> that's the word. Yeah, that's the word. No, yeah. I'm not... I don't even know how to pronounce it. I don't know whether it's clitoris or clitoris or just clit. And even just saying this makes me really uncomfortable. What's wrong you know, with me? 
I know. So it's, uh, yeah, anyway, but. Uh, I wish know. them well. They will talk about all the things that we don't talk about. Um, so that's covered. <laughs> yeah, well, and some of it. I mean, I think we do. I, I think that uh, shame is a, is a nasty it thing. It is a big thing. And, yeah. And women not supporting women. And uh, I was saying to someone the other day that like, having a co-host, I mean, the two of them, they have co-hosts. They have, they, they work that way, but I haven't, I've always kind of been on my yeah. own and here I am with you and you're another woman. We've, we've said a couple of C words and we're getting there. Yeah. And yeah. We'll be all set. <laughs> well let's just take it you know one 100 you know this i think we're like closing in on 50 episodes at some point uh in the next few weeks so we should be very proud of that really yeah yeah, like, yeah i think certainly we've celebrated our first anniversary uh since we started this and okay well math is not my strong point wendy <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. I'm, 35. I'm, 35. Then how's that? Yeah, every day is Tuesday as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But no, they were they were wonderful. And I and I think they are talking about some of the things that we're not, which is which is great. I don't want to talk about emirates, but okay. uh, but they can. And uh, and they have they have good stories. And they did. Yeah. <laughs> it was wonderful. Yeah. Anyway, lovely to see anyway, you. Anyway, lovely to see you.